Now you're cooking. Now you're cooking. I always wanted to say that. Now you're cooking. Hey guys. Hello, gorgeous. Another 80s TV show review for you, taking another look at Hardcastle and McCormick. I did the pilot episode review a couple of months back, and I just finished watching season one. The show lasted for three seasons, and the entire series is available on this box set by Vi. All three seasons come in individual cases, and they're all held by this outer box. I do like the packaging on this set. Plenty of red to go with the Red Coyote X, and really nice case inside as well. I really don't like it when classic shows are packaged with DVDs all one on top of another uh, on one spindle that can lead to damage or uh, breaking one of the prongs that hold the discs in. Every single one of these discs, there's five for season one, have their own little individual space for holding it. And there's some nice printing on each of the discs as well. Uh, real nice race racing type of look to it to go again with the, uh, the Coyote X, one of the stars of the show. Interesting to note that the picture on the season one set has Judge Milton C. Hardcastle and Mark Skid McCormick standing back to back. Uh, back to back. I'll, I'll get into that with a season two review. But uh, here they are looking really happy and chummy. And then you take a look at the picture from season two and Old Milt has a little bit of a grin. McCormick is looking a little more serious. And then by season three, these do not look like happy campers to me. Uh, it's widely regarded that the first season uh, among Hardcastle and McCormick fans is the most popular of the three and that the third season is the least popular. So it's just uh, interesting how we go from that to that. That's what you call truth and advertising, I guess. All right, a lot of you might be wondering, what the hell is Hardcastle and McCormick? And a lot of the younger audience today has never heard of it because it hasn't been rebooted or reimagined. But those of us who grew up in the 80s might remember old Hardcase and Skid and the Coyote. I never watched the show that much as a kid, but I do remember really loving the car and really loving the theme song. Sometimes I would just watch the intro because I love that theme song so much. I've already reviewed the pilot episode, but to give a quick recap for the people who haven't seen that review yet, the story involves a retiring judge named Milton C. Hardcastle who takes an ex-con who he sent to prison for two years named Mark McCormick, who is a, a former repo man and a world-class driver, he takes him under his wing and wants to mentor him. Even though the judge is retiring, he has a whole bunch of cases that he feels went unresolved because of the bureaucracy of, this, of the system. And it is a little bit like Dexter in that he is a lawman and he wasn't able to bring some of these people to justice. So now that he's retiring, he's going to do it not exactly vigilante style like Dexter, but he is going to step a little bit outside of his boundaries in order to make sure that natural justice is served. Now, some of the shows that we loved as kids don't stand the test of time, and we go back and we try to rewatch them and see if the magic can be recaptured, and they're just not all that good. One of the shows I'm experiencing right now with that is Knight Rider. I was a huge fan of Knight Rider as a kid, and I still enjoy watching the episodes today, but I'm able to see a lot more of the flaws in terms of story um, and, and everything else with Knight Rider than I could as a kid. Hardcastle and McCormick, however, I am absolutely crazy about this show, and my wife loves it too. We watch a whole bunch of 80s shows. We've got MacGyver and Magnum P.I. and Cheers and, and Fall Guy, Airwolf, all of those great shows from the 80s. And it's really fun to go back in time to the 80s, to that time period of fun and lightheartedness, 
pre-cell phones, pre-laptops, and of all the fun classic shows that my wife and I have been watching, Hardcastle and McCormick is her favorite. And she had never seen the show as a kid. She had never heard of it until I said, you got to watch this show with this awesome, cool red car and this amazing theme. But this show has shot to the top of her list uh, as being her favorite classic 80s TV show. And I got to say, it's in my top two. The other show that I'm totally blown away by is Airwolf, and I reviewed season one uh, a short while ago. Uh, Airwolf, recently released on Blu-ray, is absolutely spectacular. The flying scenes take my breath away still. I'm working my way through season two of Airwolf, and still I cannot believe the beautiful cinematography, editing, uh, filming of Airwolf, and just, just a cool ship, the lady, cool cast, awesome stories. Uh, almost every single time out. And so I would say that Airwolf and Hardcastle and McCormick are tied for my current favorite classic 80s shows. I do have to mention this though because it's absolutely adorable. Uh, sometimes she can't remember what the name of the show is. So she says, can we watch the old guy, the young guy, and that car? <laughs> but the show isn't that simple. It seems like it will be. Uh, in the pilot episode, it seems like they're teaming up the old guy with the young guy and they're giving him a cool car. And this is a Stephen J. Cannell show. He's the guy who did the A-Team, uh, Rockford Files, Greatest American Hero. Uh, Cannell, his shows all have the same feel to them. Riptide as well. Some of the not as as big hit shows. Uh, but they all had the the feeling of fun in them. Even something a little more adult, like Hunter, where people were getting shot and killed and murdered. It still had this um, fun vibe to it. Uh, Hardcastle and McCormick especially has a really fun, tongue-in-cheek, uh, buddy cop, even though they're not cops, uh, vibe to it. The chemistry between the two stars, Daniel Hugh Kelly and the late, great Brian Keith, is fantastic right off the bat. So this isn't a situation where, you know, they say for a lot of shows, give it time, it'll grow on you. They're figuring things out. Hardcastle McCormick was figured out from episode one. And I'm very happy to say that it didn't go downhill from the pilot episode. It actually kept getting better and better. Now it starts high in quality and it does go up. It's not a steep uh, increase in quality, but I did feel as the episodes progressed that the chemistry between the two stars, Hardcastle and McCormick, just kept getting better and better. And I talk a lot about genuineness on my YouTube channel. Um, and I could feel a genuine affection between those two actors for each other. There's so many scenes where Hardcastle is getting on McCormick's case and McCormick is getting on Hardcastle's case. And you can just see the genuine caring between the two actors uh, shining through the scene. and. There's a couple scenes where it just feels like, are these guys riffing? Like, this is so natural. This is not TV actors acting in an 80s show. This is just guys having fun, and I can just picture the guys behind the camera and the director going, let them go, let them go, this is awesome. You know, guys just leaning forward, and where are they going to go now? And I think that affection was genuine, because when uh, Brian Keith was presented with a star on the Walk of Fame, Daniel Hugh Kelly spoke at the ceremony, and he got legitimately choked up speaking about his uh, late great friend. Um, that's not just respect for a co-worker. I think that the relationship between Hardcastle and McCormick on the show really was genuine, and I think that those two actors felt that off-screen as well as on-screen. Now, what I think works really well about this story is that even though it's presented as an old guy, a young guy in a car, it's so much more than that because look at the old guy in this show. In a typical movie or TV show where you've got a guy playing the old guy, he would be old and crotchety and and cranky and he'd be complaining about breaking down. And You'll see young guy, you'll see when you're my age. And Milt never does that. Milt can hang with the young guy. They're always doing these bets about uh, can is Milt's conditioning as good as McCormick's and sometimes it is and he is nicknamed Hardcase but Brian Keith just has that million dollar smile uh, he's a fun guy he's responsible for a lot of the the fun and the humor and the jokes on the show as well as McCormick is so he 
carries his end of the fun aspect of the show. He's not just the curmudgeon, I'm too old for this stuff. He's the guy who, even though he's retired, is saying, I'm not too old for this. And then physically speaking about Brian Keith, the guy was jacked. You know, he's an older guy, but he looked like he had been doing his push-ups. He had been lifting his weights. He looked like a physically fit, strong guy, which I thought was great because so many times when you've got the old character, he's like the broken down guy that can't go anymore. And in this situation, the judge is more muscular than the young guy. And speaking of the young guy, he's actually not that young. Daniel Hugh Kelly was in his 30s when he did this show. So I think that adds to the chemistry working on the show. It's more of a father-son relationship than a grandfather-grandson relationship. I've seen so many movies and shows where they try to do the old guy and the young guy dynamic and it just comes off as irritating because they're just from two different worlds that are too different, too far away from each other. Um, Daniel Hugh Kelly is not a kid in this show. He's not a young guy. He's, um, you know, an ex-con, but he also does have a heart of gold as well. He, he does the right thing right from the pilot episode. He's not a slimy, sleazy guy that has to be built up from scratch by the judge and taught what honor and integrity is. McCormick goes about things a different way than the judge does. Um, sometimes he prefers the, the gray areas more than the white in, uh, in the black and white uh, scenarios. But McCormick is a good guy um, and he is absolutely hilarious. He reminds me so much of David Hasselhoff on Knight Rider, um, but better. Honestly, uh, funnier, a uh, better actor, more intense when he needs to be, um, just more uh, believable as a driver in intense driving scenes. I mean, that's a science unto itself. It's not as easy as just sitting behind the wheel of a car and them green screening stuff behind you. You have to know how to drive a car on screen, uh, even if it's just a close up and you're not actually driving. Mel Gibson was great at it in the Mad Max movies. But Daniel Hugh Kelly, um, really, like, he's such a goofy, funny character. But when he's in behind the wheel of the Coyote, it, he's all business. And he really pulls off that intensity. The time for joking and smirking is over when you're behind the wheel of the Coyote. This thing is a powerful, powerful beast. And you have to take it seriously. Um, something horrific can happen if you take a wrong turn. So I think Daniel Hugh Kelly not only is like a fantastic foil to Brian Keith's judge character, and he's not only a major source of the fun and the jokes and the lightheartedness in the show, but he is also the one that really makes the coyote as cool as it is. I think anybody else behind the wheel of that car, eh, you know, it'd be a cool car, but uh, Mark McCormick, Skid McCormick behind the wheel of the coyote, that's the total package. That's Mad Max behind the wheel of the Interceptor. And let's talk about the Cody Coyote X for a second. I think that the Coyote has now surpassed the Mad Max Interceptor as my favorite TV or movie car of all time. I love the Interceptor, but the fact is there are just a few minutes of it on screen. It's only at the end of Mad Max, uh, really, other than a quick cameo earlier in the movie. And then it gets destroyed halfway through Road Warrior and then blink and you miss it in Fury Road. But the Cody Coyote is in the show the entire first season, almost every single episode. And when it's in there, those, uh, those chase scenes are so awesome. I figured it would get formulaic after a while. Bad guys are taken off, McCormick jumps into the Coyote and okay, he's going to catch him. But Every single time he revved up that engine and took off, man, I was drawn into it. I, I, I got chills. I was like, holy crap, it's the coyote. I was so excited about it. That's time travel, or as close as you're going to get to it. Popping in these DVDs of classic TV shows, going back in time, and feeling that thrill that we felt back in the day. Uh, we watch these old nos nostalgic shows because we want to feel that thrill again. And unfortunately, a lot of those old shows can't deliver anymore but but Hardcastle and McCormick absolutely did time and time again I'm not sitting here saying half of the episodes are pretty good I mean I enjoyed almost every single episode of season one 
And a major reason why the coyote is so awesome in the show is practical stunts, no CGI on this show, and a book came out a while ago about the making of and behind the scenes of Hardcastle and McCormick, and there's a couple chapters dedicated to the coyote, and it turns out that they had a couple of these cars. One was uh, intended mainly for interior shots, where McCormick and Hardcastle would be sitting in there and talking to each other. The other car was the one that was um, intended for driving and uh, jumping and stuff like that. And apparently the car that was developed for the driving stuff, that wasn't actually Daniel Hugh Kelly driving it. The guy who, who designed the car was the only one who could figure out how to drive it. Um, so from what the book says, it wasn't exactly the easiest car to drive. Uh, from what I read, it sounded kind of like a nightmare to shift and to turn and to just handle the thing. So even though on the show it's presented as this amazing supercar, and it, it comes off that way on the show, in execution, in reality, it actually seemed like something that was held together uh, by thumbtacks and gum. And so the, the stunts that are done on the show with this car impress me so much more than the stuff we see today that's practical in the movies like The Fast and the Furious because those cars in The Fast and the Furious are off screen what they are presented on screen. They got the horsepower, the speed, the steering capability. Still a difficult stunt, but the tool given to the stuntman is so much better than the tool that was given on Hardcastle and McCormick. This thing couldn't do much, and yet on screen it's jumping off of ramps onto other cars, it's fish tailing, and without a doubt my favorite stunt in the entire first season is from the 21st episode called Did You See the One That Got Away? where McCormick is driving with Hardcastle in the Coyote, he's being boxed in by a bunch of trucks, and he drives the drive! He drives the Coyote underneath one of the trucks that's driving beside him and that might seem like a pretty easy stunt because we've seen it in a few other things uh it was in a fast and the furious movie as well but watching that just blew my mind because i know how how badly that car handles uh how not precise it is how fast that truck is going the precision the timing to be able to drive that car underneath that truck and not get hit by the back wheels. He drives it for a little bit. It's not just one second then he passes right through. He drives under it for a couple of seconds, doesn't get hit by the back wheels, the front wheels, uh, and then eventually does take the turn off and get away. But that, that shot right there just blew my mind. And the show is filled with all sorts of little gems like that. So even in the episodes that don't have big, exciting, complicated uh, stories behind them. It's an 80s show with practical effects, so there are all these little gems of super exciting, very dangerous uh, stunts. And when there's an actual danger related to the stunt, I just feel more excitement. I feel more intensity. I'm drawn more into it. Now, I'm not wanting people to get hurt or killed on this show, but... If something is done 100% safe with green screen and CGI, I just don't buy it. It just it doesn't feel real to me. There isn't an urgency there. Whereas on these old shows pre-CGI uh, and and not too much green screen, there's just so much more intensity and rawness and realness to it. The premise of the show that's set up in the pilot episode is that Milt wants to go after all these criminals that he didn't get behind bars with the help of McCormick. And that's actually not what happens throughout most of the season. They get sidetracked with other little adventures and missions. Uh, it is very cool, though, when he does run into one of his old cases and then we feel like we're getting back on track. Aha, all right, we're going we're gonna to do what he set out to do. But I actually think that was a great way to go with the show because it would have felt too much like a job um, to constantly, what's the next case? What's the next case? We got to go back to work. This guy is retired. He should be enjoying his retirement. And I, I think it's cool the way they handled it to just have him go and do these adventures. Uh, and then every once in a while, go back to this original mission that he 
conceived with uh, McCormick's help. And what I really liked about the judge's character is that even though he's retired, he's almost like a celebrity to the police force. They all respect him. Uh, they, they cut him a lot of slack and they do him a lot of favors. Uh, same goes for like Department of Information. He's able to get tips from the records department. It's really cool that even though he's retired, his reputation opens a lot of doors for him instead of banging his head against a wall and going, what do I have to do in order to make any progress here? It's something that could have been extremely irritating, but they decided not to do it. This guy's a lawman and he wants to continue upholding the law. And in the fantasy world of this TV show, they let him. Just a great, fun, classic 80s show. Great for the whole family. Good values. Really strong writing. Great, great scenes. Great performances between Hardcastle and McCormick. And being an older show, you're going to see quite a few familiar faces in this. A lot of uh, actors who went on to become very well known got their start, or this was one of their first roles in Hardcastle and McCormick. Um, one of the most surprising little uh, cameo appearances was a very young Tim Robbins, who was, uh, I guess he got typecast because he's playing a convict in a jail in, in uh, the episode he appears in in this show. So uh, that might be why he got the part of Andy Dufresne. Although uh, in Hardcastle and McCormick, he's not as charming as Andy. He's actually just a shithead. I guess that's a lot of gushing. So I feel like in order to balance things out a little bit, I'll give you two little nitpicks. One of them is that I really love how the show starts out with the little uh, regular recap that so many 80s shows had. They show you what you're about to see. It's like a trailer for the episode you're about to see. And the first couple episodes, the recap would end. And as soon as it was done, you hear that engine rev. And then you hear drive. And that is just boom. It's like hitting a ramp. It really psyched me up for the episode. Great way to start the episode. But after the first few episodes, they stopped doing it that way. They'd show you the trailer. And then they included this really cheesy recap of the premise of the show and they show you a long shot of a courthouse and they give you the spiel of judge milton c hardcastle is a retired judge and uh mark mccormick is an ex-con and and then they play the theme song and every single time i just felt like oh you took the wind out of the sails you have this awesome trailer and then this dry thing with this dry music playing and then it's really dis disjointed and they try to improve upon it a few episodes later by, instead of showing a shot of the courthouse, they actually showed a shot of Hardcastle walking out of the courthouse with uh, McCormick and taking his handcuffs off, which never appeared in the show. So they, I guess, just shot it specifically for the intro uh, with the same voiceover spiel. But again, I thought, leave it out. It's, it's a fun show. It's lighthearted. You don't need to explain it away. You... People will figure it out within the first five minutes of the show, and if they don't, who cares? It's still fun. Uh, so that's the one thing that I, I really felt like I wish I could skip this intro to just jump ahead of it um, so that you know we could hit that ramp and, and get all revved up. Other nitpick is the actual video quality on the DVDs. Uh, it, is, it is not good, to be quite honest. Um, and that's probably because I've been watching Airwolf and Knight Rider on newly remastered Blu-ray. This is uh, this is DVD and it's, it doesn't even really look like DVD quality. Maybe, you know, just a little above VHS. So th this wasn't taken from the original film masters. Hopefully one day um, some company will take the time and the effort to remaster it into Blu-ray because I think this show has legs just based on the talent of Brian Keith and Daniel Hugh Kelly and that car. I mean that that car it's 2017 and it's still gorgeous. It's still amazing. It's uh, it's basically a McLaren but you know the little tweaks they did to it um, make it a car all its own. So if you want to watch Hardcastle and McCormick it's the best you're gonna get. Uh, it's certainly much better than watching something that's even more uh, condensed and compressed on like a YouTube or a daily motion. I really like having something to hold in my hand instead of having it just 
be digital sitting on a hard drive somewhere. So this is a very nice set. Very nice pictures on the DVD cases. Uh, nice printing on the, the actual DVDs themselves. And for what they had to work with, I think Vi did a, a very good job with it. And I think it really speaks to the quality of Hardcastle and McCormick that I had so much fun and enjoyed this so much despite this not being HD or even high-end standard definition. All right, that's Hardcastle and McCormick Season 1. I will definitely be doing a Season 2 review once I'm finished watching that. Hope it lives up to the standard set by Season 1, although I'm a little skeptical because they did change the coyote in Season 2 and they used a DeLorean instead for the gullwing doors to make it easier for the actors to get in and out of. But uh, we'll see about that. In the sake of synchronicity, I'm also going to be doing a review for the vintage 80s Ertl Coyote, so check that out as well. So till next time, push it to the floor till the engine screams. Driving like the demon that drives your dreams. Nerd mistake. Now you're cooking.